all done. Go ahead. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Elsevier Asia Pacific Expert Series webinar. We are still waiting for more participants to join us. So while we are waiting, let's enjoy a quick video from Elsevier. Thank you. This is you. You are a researcher or a funder, a librarian, physician, nurse, R&D professional, or health educator. Every single day, you dedicate yourself to accelerating progress in your field, to improving outcomes, not just for you, but for the global community you are part of. You believe in the future of science, research, and medicine in an open future full of possibilities. At Elsevier, we share that belief. This is why we feel privileged to serve you with reliable information and valuable insights, something we are proud to have done for over 140 years. Our tools put you in control. You can count on us in upholding the highest standards of quality and integrity. We play our part in building a better future for research, healthcare, and people everywhere. True, much progress has been made, yet challenges still exist. Challenges we want to meet through innovation, through partnerships, through accelerating you. So together, we can make a lasting impact on society. Okay, so once again, yeah, welcome everyone. Welcome to webinar expert series, Asia Pacific Research Data Management, why it matters and how to manage. My name is Johan Jiang. I'm customer consultant for Elsevier Southeast Asia. And with me, I have Sally. Sally is also a customer consultant from Elsevier in Australia. And we are both going to be your hosts and also moderator for this wonderful uh, event, okay? So before we start, I would like to, of course, welcome all participants, yeah, not just from Asia Pacific, because we have so many people from uh, other regions as well. So thank you so much for joining us. We have amazing numbers of participants already joining us this uh, morning and afternoon. So a couple of announcements before we start our session. First, yeah, we are using Zoom webinar format, which means that you will not be able to unmute yourself, but no, no worries. If you have any questions, you can direct your questions using the Q&A feature available, okay? And then we will have our Q&A session. So all of your questions will be answered after the speaker session. And of course, the information is on slides, the recording and the e-certificates will be provided to you at the end of the session. Okay, so this is our agenda for uh, this um, this uh, morning and afternoon. You know, first, we will have the introductions to the topic, and then after that, the speaker sessions, uh, Q and A, and lastly, we will have our uh, closing and announcement. Okay. So to begin our um, sessions, yeah, because this is on RDM and research data management, uh, we would like to run a quick poll yeah, just to uh, gauge everyone's understanding on what is RDM. So as you will be able to see on your screen right now, there is a poll uh, and the questions is on how confident are you, how confident are you in your understanding of research data management or RDM? We already have, 300, 400 people starting to answer uh, these uh, questions. Wonderful. Yeah, let's wait a bit yeah, for more of you. Yeah, uh, For you that just join us, yeah, again, welcome. We're just starting out our session with our first poll. Yeah, So please do answer this one because we would like to know how confident are you and your understanding of research data management. Okay, Let's just wait for another... 20, 30 seconds yeah, before we close our, our poll. Okay, let's see, we already have 70% of you already answering. Yeah. 
Okay. Let's see, are you very confident? Are you very familiar yeah, with what is RDM? Are you somewhat confident yeah, or not confident yeah, or not sure at all? Let's see. Yeah, We have 75% now. Okay. This is so great to see so many people answering this poll uh, live. Yeah. Okay. Let's do another 15 seconds before we close the poll. 80% already coming in. Yep. Okay. okay let's wait until 85%. Yeah. Okay, so I think uh, we can end our poll, yeah, and let's see the search, uh, the result, yeah. So as you can see right now on your screen, yeah, this is the first poll that we run. How confident are you in your understanding of RDM? And the answer is, uh, we have 7% answering very confident, good, that's very good. Uh, and then most of you, majority of you, 43% answer uh, somewhat confident. So. You're, you know a little bit about RDM, but you want to know more about uh, RDM. 40% of you uh, mentioned, I'm not confident, yeah, but I already heard about the terminology. So of course, you will be very eager to learn about RDM or I'm not sure at all. Yeah, no worries. Yeah? For those answering somewhat confident, not really confident or not sure at all. Yeah, this is why you are here to learn from our speakers. Yeah, so to... Uh, introduce our speakers, yeah, introduce the topic plus introduce the speakers. I would like to pass over uh, the stage yeah, to my colleague, um, Sally. Over to you, Sally. Thanks, Johan. Uh, just to begin today, I would like to acknowledge the Camaragal people as the traditional custodians of the lands and waters from where I'm speaking today. And I pay my respects to all Aboriginal elders, past, present and future. So thank you all for being here today. And as I get started, let me say research data management. It seems, you know, not such a not such a difficult topic, right? Well, some people think it's not very simple. So we're here to talk about it today. So let's walk through a researcher's experience with research data management. And we'll take a look at Professor Sean. Here he is with his glasses, love Professor Sean. He's a researcher in the medical sciences who collects data from experiments in a laboratory, as well as patient interviews. The institution Sean works for has a research data management policy that he must follow. And the policy is supported by both the library and the research office who manage the tools to help Sean carry out research data management. Sean must share the information that he collects with his team and his supervisors and they need to be able to navigate the data immediately and independently. The data Sean collects is quite large and some of it is of a sensitive nature, so it must be stored correctly and safely. Sean's project is just one part of an ongoing study, which means the data needs to be preserved and available for use in the future. Sean's research is funded by the government and an external funder. Both of these funders have research data management policies that Sean will need to adhere to. The journals that Sean is planning to publish in require at the very least a data availability statement. So Sean will need to read and follow the journal's data sharing policies. So to say Sean has a lot to consider when it comes to data management uh, is a bit of an understatement. So no wonder we think, uh, no wonder he thinks it's not so simple. But today, don't fear. If you feel like Sean currently, hopefully after this session, you will feel more in control. As today, we have two lovely speakers for you who have experience in research data management, both from a researcher and a librarian perspective. They will share their advice on research data management and break down the complexities of this topic. 
To begin our session today, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker, Roxanne Missingham, who sports a rather impressive resume. Roxanne is the University Librarian and Chief Scholarly Information Officer at the Australian National University. In, uh, sorry, she's, uh, sorry, Roxanne is the University Librarian and Chief Scholarly Information Officer. She sports two hats in this, in this institution. And with those two hats on, she is responsible for the library's archives, press, records, privacy, copyright, and digital scholarship. So she's quite a busy lady. She was previously Parliamentary Librarian and Assistant Director General Resource Sharing Division at the National Library of Australia. And she has a long career in libraries and IT, focused on the development of digital delivery and digital services. Formerly president of the Australian Library and uh, Australian Library and Information Association, otherwise known as ALIA, she is currently a copyright lead for the Council of Australian University Librarians. And in her spare time, which I don't think she has a lot of, she's also a member of many national and international digital research library committees. And last but not least, in 2021, Roxanne was awarded the prestigious Order of Australia Award. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us today. Roxanne, over to you. Thank you so much, Sally. It's a real privilege to be here and I'm delighted to be with a community that is committed to great data practice um, and believes it's a challenge we need to take on together. And your example was just a brilliant way to start. So I'd like to start by saying Yuma, uh, and uh, acknowledge the Indigenous people on whose lands I am today, the Ngambri Ngunnawal people, uh, and pay my respects to leaders past, present and emerging. So here we are in 2022. And as S Sally has said, you know, great enthusiasm. We all need to use research data. Uh, we all need to know it's managed. It's a journey we've been on for quite a while. But there's so many complex issues that we are only part way along the journey. And I'd like in particular to thank uh, Nicola Burton and Lyle Winton from AIDC for the work that they're doing that I will be talking about in this set of slides as well. So data is a vital issue. It's really critical to all of the work that we do, the work that we do in libraries to help digital scholarship succeed, uh, the work that is done by researchers, the work that is done by funders to make sure that e-research happens. And we've seen quite a significant evolution in the way we're thinking about electronic research and data. We used to talk about e-research and we just say now it is research and electronic digital data is just fundamental to practice. We see it discussed as a national policy issue. So while we work very hard in our institutions and each researcher works very hard for every activity that they're engaged with, um, Australia actually sees that it is vital that we make some national steps forward. And so we've had the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy from our government for almost a decade now that has launched a number of initiatives to try and help everyone through this very complex set of problems. So just as a bit of a context, in Australia, we've got 39 public universities, all with amazing researchers producing amazing research. We educate about 1.5 million students, employ almost 130,000 staff, and we contribute around $41 billion to the economy. About a third of that is from direct research activity. There'd been a whole raft as well in Australia of reports on the importance of data, uh, focusing very much on uh, government data, some of them, a, a number of them have referred to the importance of research data, the importance of sharing that data, and the importance, particularly from the Acad Acad Australian Academy of Science report, for ensuring that data is um, is fair, is accessible, is findable, uh, and all of them acknowledging that we are really still, despite um, almost 20 years of work in this area, still in the early stages of developing a mature infrastructure across the nation um, and developing skill sets and other strat strategic issues to be able to make research data work. So lots of work has gone into it. It's really recognised as a national issue, but we are still at the beginning of the journey. 
So in our universities, we've been undertaking quite significant areas of work, particularly with support from the Australian uh, National Data Service and now the Australian Research Data Commons. Libraries, research areas have really focused on the development of skills and knowledge, and that's probably been well established for a long time, particularly skills around metadata, uh, around life cycle planning, with a lot of training to help build that capacity. We've seen projects that build on rights and data management skills delivered in a range of regions and through a range of collaborative activities. And the emphasis on that has been collaboration across the, the whole of the sector to be able to achieve improvements in practice and be able to achieve improved infrastructure for things like storage. At the Australian National University, two examples of how this has been implemented are our research data management training hub, um, which sits on a LibGuide and results in, it, it supports training, um, particularly for early career researchers and PhD students, uh, and the Data Commons Library that enables research to be stored, small research supercomputer contains much more research and shared, including through Research Data Australia, which is the national discovery portal. So we've got a number of pieces of infrastructure in place, but the real question is what are the critical issues and how do we holistically create a consistent experience across universities that really assists researchers to manage their data, to understand how it needs to be supported and to be able to tap into the resources to be able to support them. So the Australian Research Data Commons, uh, which was created as the result of the merger of three services, including the National Data Service, which had done a lot of work on infrastructure, uh, was formed in uh, th around three years ago um, in order to provide integrated support funded by the Commonwealth Government. And that pulling together of services to be able to create a national perspective on um, uh, data management, uh, software platforms, storage and people and policy is really creating an environment where we can discuss the issues and what needs to happen nationally. So I, I'm really enthused by the fact that when we're thinking about research data management, we're not just thinking, well, a researcher has to manage their data and the library has to be the storehouse and the metadata. It's really about saying, well, how can we have an effective national infrastructure for national benefit? How can we transform our national research capability to develop proper national capabilities that allow in industry engagement and international impact and engagement through working together. So in working on the whole nature of research data and governance, we really need to bring a lot of aspects together. We need to make sure that we have people who have the knowledge to be able to effectively manage data uh, they have to have the skills, they have to be able to integrate the thinking around all of the requirements, huge range of requirements that are around resources, researchers. We need to have a whole lot of policies so that in the institution, the policy and procedure environment is clear and each researcher doesn't have to do a discovery uniquely. We need to have a real focus on research outcomes, which includes how we can have the partnerships to be able to make things work, how we're able to deliver new solutions by integrating the services across our universities, and also how we can have the tools for things like research data planning, for things like research data storage, and how we can have them in a transparent and effective way, rather than some of the procedures now where we have disconnect around, for example, ethics management, data storage, privacy, cybersecurity. So everything is quite complex at the moment from the researcher's perspective of meeting those needs. So the Australian Research Data Commons has initiated a project called Institutional Research Data Management Policies and Procedures to start enabling universities to have a conversation about what needs to happen and be able to produce the national um, if you like, pieces of uh, 
kit so that we can actually have procedures, policies, planning processes, data management planning processes available to researchers and universities to be able to effectively support researchers. So in taking this project forward with 25 universities, we really are framing solutions that will meet the main legislative requirement for researchers in Australia, and that is under the Australian Code of Responsible Conduct of Research Practice, which every university is required to maintain. And often that code sits in bodies in procedures and is aspirational and can be uh, very challenging for a researcher to understand how they have to comply with all of these requirements. So the requirement to ensure that there are a suite of policies and procedures that are consistent with those responsibilities is something that we believe we can tackle to be able to have a more effective system that will support research data management. So we have an action map in the policy document that includes the four components of rights, which um, really are often the legislative basis and other institutional policy basis that uh, researchers need to comply with. Security, cyber security, IT architecture, data standards and guidelines. So record retention, how long do research uh, data uh, collections need to last for? How can they be classified so that they can be used? How can we have standards? And then also from the university's requirements, how can we make sure that we are meeting the audit and risk requirements that are compliant with the university's financial management and risk management processes? Um, and many of these are also articulated by funders. So it's the reporting, it's the management, it's all of these aspects coming together. How can we create a new environment that will support research data management? in a way that will allow all of these to be unpacked. So what have we been doing over the last 18 months while we've been working on this project? Well, we've been working very hard to produce a framework because we thought the most important aspect of our first step would be to understand all of the areas that we need to have uh, good management policy and procedures to be able to support the work of researchers. So we broke into working groups and looked at all of the different aspects around active data management, cultural change, institutional policies, research data management planning, retention and disposal, open research and data publication, sensitive data and support training and guidance. And then there were some additional elements that weren't at the high level. So in putting this guideline together, which describes the nature of the challenge for researchers and the nature of the challenge in essence for research officers, um, IT areas and libraries to be able to provide support in, uh, we've come up with a set of issues with some preliminary case studies that are openly accessible and there are links in this presentation that enable improvements in practice in Australian universities. But the question is how we take that into action. So a number of universities have policies that uh, map closely to this. Many others are evolving policies at ANU, our uh, data management uh, policy, data governance policy and half a dozen procedures will be out in about a month. It's been on a, a 12 month journey of consultation within the university to make sure it's effective. But we really need to have more guidance on how to make this live for researchers. So the project has kicked off a number of projects on issues like data retention and disposal, um, RDM training, culture change, as well as producing uh, more model policy documents, training materials for data stewards and data classification. And all of these activities will result in publicly accessible documentation, case studies, guidelines. Now, at this point, what I wanted to just explain in the Australian context, and I'm sure this is the same in the US and Europe and throughout Asia, um, the context in which we need to deliver our research data management support 
needs to consider not just one piece of legislation, such as the Code of Responsible Use uh, of Research, there are a whole range of legislative requirements around that. So every university has its own act. Some are state or, in our case, Commonwealth Government entities. So we have other governance acts. There's a Privacy Act, Archives Act, Security of Critical Infrastructure. And when we map our policies, we need to have an overarching framework that we're able to see how that needs to translate into guidance for researchers, because none of us expect researchers to have to read and interpret the legislation that would be something that would guarantee they would need a good lie down and um, a lot of cups of coffee to come up from. So in doing this sort of mapping and having this for each institution, uh, it enables us to frame, it will enable us to frame on all of the documentation and, and guidelines are available, how the good data management practices can be mapped into the procedures that need to underpin legislation. And then there's mapping as well about who can take responsibility to deliver the solutions that will help, for example, some libraries do data training, some research areas do data training, um, some data storage guidelines sit in um, human ethics, some sit in other corporate entities. So it's how do we map all of this into a simple and clear framework so the researchers can be able to be effectively supported uh, and the institution can comply with these requirements. So a number of universities have done quite a lot of deep thinking about this. And these next two slides are from Monash University, um, where the mapping again of these legal requirements has resulted in a framework, uh, which you will see in common with some other universities where responsibilities are allocated. So the researcher is often the data producer and the research resources that they, research data that they are, uh, collecting, they may well be the custodian as well, but there may be other responsibilities. Uh, for example, their material may be recorded in an integrated research management system, in which case the executive steward may be a deputy vice chancellor. So we need to have processes where our management of data can be done effectively by the researcher, but the university can support that by having evolving systems that will keep moving to meet the needs of researchers and the researchers can be freed to do the research, um, but the improvements to infrastructure can be managed by the university. This is another example of life cycle from Monash of that life cycle management. So you can see the different aspects that need to come in a university in a university to help the researcher uh, get to the point of being able to uh, apply for a grant, be successful in a grant and have their data housed appropriately, being able to get appropriate reporting, um, training, access, including open access to be able to make it all work. So one of the important things about this project is, is it's enabling a national shared discussion of researchers, research support areas, librarians, technologists, and policy makeups, uh, makers to deliver a shared set of outcomes that can be used by every university in Australia. And in fact, can be models that can be adapted elsewhere in the world. So the outcomes so far have been some policy model documents for institutions, a great awareness of data repositories and data management responsibilities, data management planning systems have been recorded that link all aspects of life and work is being done on a number of multi-institution projects to produce um, some templates that are able to integrate over the whole life cycle of uh, a research data project, a, a project that has research data to enable that to happen. Um, and guidance is being produced steadily through this project. And the intention is that we will have a nationally active and engaged approach to data management that is researcher focused, so that much of the good work that's already been done developing skills, uh, developing individual researcher training programs in universities and developing repositories, can be articulated into a holistic support for researchers and for research across the nation. 
And there are a number of projects that are happening as well around sensitive data, health information in particular, um, that will produce quite complex guidelines. And we're consulting with the national funder on that. So that is the end of my presentation. Um, I think I'm on time. <laughs> I could talk for hours about this, but I think it's, <laughs> I think it's time for the next speaker and we can talk about lots of things in the discussion part of this. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Roxanne. I think uh, the presentation is absolutely brilliant. Um, you know, managing data in just in an institution level already a, a difficult thing to do. But what you what you just uh, present, it's it's such a wonderful project. I, I, I believe that everything already being uh, already thought of uh, by the team. Yeah, so you have the you have, you are thinking that the, the there needs to be uh, of course policies people we need to think about technology the outcomes yeah how it how the framework is going to be and the work in the past eighteen months I think as you mentioned um, it can be rep even replicated with of course a little bit of modifications here and there not just in Australia but even. Uh, in other parts of the world. So I think this is such a great project. Thank you so much for, for sharing. We already have a couple of questions, uh, yep. but before we go into the discussion, yeah, the, the Q&A, I believe we, uh, we can go with the uh, our second speaker. Yeah, so uh, I'll, uh, for the second speaker, I'll introduce uh, Paferi, uh, but before that, uh, just a quick announcement for everyone, for all the attendees. Yeah, again, if you have any questions, yeah, please put your questions in the Q&A and we'll be happy to answer your questions later on in the discussion part. Okay, so thank you so much, Roxanne. Uh, we are going to, I'm going to introduce our second speaker for um, today. Let me share my screen. Okay, yeah. So for our uh, second session, we have Ferry Effendi. So Ferry is a secretary uh, of Institute of Innovation, Journal Development, Publications, and Intellectual Property Rights from Universitas Erlangga in Surabaya, Indonesia. So just a quick prof uh, profile. Ferry is uh, secretary at yeah, uh, the Institute of Innovation, Journal, uh, Publications, and Intellectual Property Rights from University uh, of Erlangga, and also a lecturer of nursing in the Department of Advanced uh, Nursing, Faculty of Nursing, uh, at this, of course, the same university. So he holds a PhD in nursing, uh, which focusing on Indonesian's nurses' migration. Yeah, in addition, he also had been involved in various projects within the area of human resources for the health at the Ministry of Health Indonesia. His research interests include health policy, community health, and nurse migration. So I believe uh, through his perspective yeah, from this department, we will be able to see how data also manage yeah, at this time uh, from institutional uh, point of view. So uh, with that, I give the floor and yeah, the stage to uh, Ferry. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Johan. Uh, good morning and good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, firstly, let me express my sincere gratitude to Elsevier and also the team uh, we are having here uh, Sally, yeah, Messi, and Fisal, and also uh, to our great uh, speaker, Roxanne. Yeah, it is nice to see you at this prestigious moment. And uh, many thanks, uh, especially for the uh, Sophia, yeah, to the continued support to uh, Universitas uh, Erlangga. Uh, this morning, I'm very honored uh, to have an opportunity to set a topic uh, with a title. Uh, let me share my PPT. Yeah, uh, research data, why it matters, and how to manage. Yeah, I think uh, Roxanne already highlighted uh, some uh, important uh, aspect and critical aspect regarding the research data management. And uh, I would like uh, to share with uh, all of you from the uh, perspective uh, of my institution and uh, myself as a faculty member and uh, researchers. So, uh, talking a little bit about my uh, university, uh, Universitas Erlangga, uh, we have uh, 15 uh, faculties uh, with two schools, uh, and we provided a 174 study program with uh, six uh, campuses. And uh, our study programs uh, are various, yeah, ranging uh, from the uh, health sciences, yeah, life sciences, uh, physical sciences, and also uh, social sciences, yeah. 
And so far, our student body uh, have around uh, 41,000 uh, students with uh, more than 2,000 uh, academic staff and more than uh, 2,000 uh, non-teaching academic staff. And in terms of the research and practice uh, facilities, yeah, uh, we do have a university teaching hospital, Institute of Tropical Disease, uh, Hospital for Infectious Tropical Disease, Dental Hospital, and Animal Hospital. Sorry, uh, I think I. Yeah. And then, in terms of the world uh, ranking uh, university, especially uh, from the QS uh, World Ranking University in uh, 2020. Uh, we are uh, very happy that uh, we are on the rank of uh, 369 in the world and then 113 in Asia, 19 in Southeast Asia and uh, fourth in Indonesia. And also according to the uh, Times Higher Education World University ranking, uh, we are on the place of uh, 1,201. And uh, Universitas Erlangga, very welcome for the potential uh, collaboration with international partners uh, for the following programs uh, include uh, staff exchange, student exchange, research collaboration, and joint publication, joint uh, degree, uh, uh, joint lecture, joint supervision, joint international conferences, uh, international internship program, and also joint international program. So uh, we are very welcome, and I would like to invite uh, everyone to visit our Erlangga Global engagement that dealing with the international collaboration matters okay, next so today i would like to share with you regarding uh, uh, some uh, activities yeah to the research data management at uh, universitas and langa and how we preserve uh, sharing and uh, improving uh, research data through our uh, newest platform yeah we call it uh, scholar unet and uh, this is powered by viewer and also a practical uh, guideline for using a scholar online uh, platform. So as you may aware, at the global level, uh, the new movement of open science is becoming a trend. Uh, data and scientific works must be more open, yeah? uh, accessible to the public, and the research results are reproducible, uh, can be copied, uh, replicated, and verified. So there are more options for researchers or uh, citizens yeah, to send more kinds of research outputs, yeah, such as open access, open educational resources, open source, inclusion, open data, and uh, citizen uh, science. So uh, firstly, I would like to uh, share with you the, with the definition of uh, data according to the Ministry of Health in uh, 2021. So, uh, data or research data is a collection of notes, yeah, of facts, yeah, uh, or description in the form of numeric characters, uh, symbol, pictures, map, sign, writing, yeah, uh, so on, uh, uh, represent the actual situation or indicate an idea, object, condition, or situation. So you can imagine uh, regarding the definition of this data that uh, the data also very big and also very diverse, yeah. So all form of research data, uh, starting from the raw data to the uh, process uh, data, it means that from the idea generation, uh, uh, funding opportunity, grant application, grant wanted, yeah, until uh, further uh, stages of the uh, journey of the life cycle of uh, our research, yeah, uh, it should be track yeah it should be stored it should be uh, preserved yeah accessible discoverable yeah also yeah it should be settable yeah uh, comprehensible yeah reviewed and uh, reusable so uh, this is uh, actually a challenge yeah for university because uh, as you understand that uh, every day uh, university produce a lot of data so many faculty members yeah many uh, uh, researchers yeah also doing a lot of uh, projects and i believe uh, they are producing uh, such a huge amount of uh, data so what is uh, research uh, data management uh, research data management is a term that describes the organization yeah 
the storage, uh, preservation, and uh, sharing of data collected and used in research project. So it is uh, started from research planning, active uh, state uh, of research, and also uh, sharing results. And uh, the benefit of the research data management is uh, one, we can easily find and understand data. Uh, second, we can also increase the impact, uh, make research reproducible, increase reuse potential, and also comply with uh, funder mandates. Yeah. And uh, that's why uh, the research data management is really matters yeah, for university and uh, research life yeah, as a responsible uh, science movement. Yeah. So we talk about the national uh, policy in Indonesia uh, according to the law number 11 yeah, uh, year 2019 uh, concerning the national system of science and technology. So actually the law uh, uh, mandated as a technical guideline yeah, for the implementation of uh, policies yeah, is uh, required to submit and also uh, retain research data. So to support data disclosure at the institutional level, yeah, research institution implement mandatory submission and storage policies yeah, by providing an institutional repository. So in, in general, uh, uh, the, the law also uh, mandated that we should comply with the fair principle. Yeah? First is the finable. Yeah? So uh, the research data management uh, should be easy to find by both human and machine. And then the second is uh, accessible. So the research data also should make uh, explicit yeah, for both human and machine. And then uh, I is interoperable, interoperable. Yeah. So metadata should be a standardized term yeah, and have references to other metadata and be machine actionable. And then the last one is reusable. So metadata are sufficiently well described for both human and computers to be able to understand them and have a clear and accessible data usage uh, license. Yeah. Uh, this is an um, interface yeah, of our uh, a local repository at uh, our university. So you may uh, take a look at the repository.unet.ac.id uh, yeah, for uh, the purpose of uh, sharing result of our research output. So uh, here I would like to uh, share with uh, all of you our journey yeah, using a scholar UNEM. Uh, actually the uh, Scholar uh, UNED is a pure platform yeah, forward by uh, Elsevier and uh, pure here uh, bring information yeah, from all the data sources yeah, into a single and secure platform. And uh, it has uh, really strengthened our research uh, governance yeah, in terms of the research information management uh, system. So by having this platform, yeah, uh, we can compile and integrate and also uh, communicate yeah, with uh, all of the data yeah, within our uh, university. So here uh, we can uh, take a look at uh, some features later at the uh, next slide. So uh, what is the uh, function of the uh, newest platform yeah, by Scholar UNED or Pure? Yeah. Uh, actually, uh, the Scholar UNED uh, integrate uh, uh, two biggest data, yeah, internal data and also external data. And for the internal data, as I mentioned before, yeah, we do have a big and various uh, amount of uh, data produced by uh, institution and also uh, unit and, and uh, our researchers. Yeah. It is include from media report, uh, funding application, yeah, uh, affiliation and collaborators, yeah, activities, uh, online sources, yeah, uh, application equipment, yeah, research output, uh, pattern, uh, intellectual property, grant and awards, yeah, human resources, website, uh, Excel, and also student. So this is very complete, yeah, and also all of the data captured by uh, uh, Scholar UNED. And then uh, the second one, we also uh, can use this platform uh, to uh, pull out all of the data from the external data. So from the external data, uh, it can be from uh, Scopus, from CrossRef, PubMed, 
Web of Science, uh, Mendeley, yeah, and many other external databases. Yeah. So we can uh, uh, compile uh, for both yeah, internal and external data, and we can use uh, for the centralized uh, data set. Yeah. And also we can generate a report for the review and compliant monitoring. Yeah. This is for the purpose of insight is uh, decision. And then we can also use the data for the research output, reusable data, uh, researcher profile, and uh, this is uh, actually for the purpose of uh, collaboration. And also we can uh, use and analyze uh, the data of funding management, awarded grants, application tracking, and compliant monitoring. Yeah, this is for the increased uh, funding opportunities. And uh, finally, uh, we can use the data for the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, reporting, yeah, uh, press media, equipment, prices, project, yeah, uh, for the purpose of global impact and recognition. Yeah. So I think this is a very yeah, complex uh, and also uh, really uh, helpful uh, flows yeah, that help our institution uh, to compile uh, various uh, data into uh, uh, one platform. So in a simple way, uh, the uh, scholar owner yeah, or peer yeah, uh, centralize uh, all of the uh, research uh, data. Yeah, and yeah, we can uh, have, a, I think, a great a benefit yeah, for us, yeah, especially when we want to use uh, the data for the decision making yeah, and also for the uh, purpose of uh, benchmarking. So how this platform boosts your organization reputation and advance open science by demonstrating the research uh, expertise and impact to strategic partners, uh, government and uh, funders. Yeah, Here you can see the researcher profile yeah? and then uh, uh, the name, yeah? the uh, affiliation and you can go deeper with the uh, department and also the uh, research unit and also you can uh, find many uh, important and odd critical information yeah, regarding the social media and also uh, how many publication and its index from uh, Scopus. Yeah. And once again, uh, this platform also highlighted all the research journey yeah, from uh, planning at this state and sharing this out. Yeah. Here you can uh, see the overview, you can see the fingerprints, you can see the network, project, research output, data set, yeah, prices, activities, and yeah, many other things related to the uh, teaching, yeah, uh, research and community service. So if you go deeper to the personal profile, yeah, we can also uh, adjust the uh, personal profile, yeah, with a complete information, yeah, regarding uh, what is the research interest of each researcher, yeah, and. Uh, what do they teach yeah and uh, what do they expertise yeah related to the uh, sustainable development goals yeah so it is uh, automatically recognized yeah using uh, an ai yeah from uh, scholar uh, platform yeah and we can easily track down all of the uh, activities related to the sustainable development goals and also yeah some other uh, related information uh, from the researcher and uh, here, as you can see from the research output uh, features, yeah, it is also tracked on all of your research output yeah, during your uh, career yeah, as a researcher or faculty members. Yeah. So you can see how many publications do you have, how many uh, patents, how many review articles, yeah, and yeah, many more. Yeah. So this is uh, really fancy for us. Yeah. So in our platform, a uh, scholar uh, platform, yeah, because uh, the platform uh, capture and compile uh, all of the research data management in our institution, yeah, this is also capture uh, the COVID nineteen projects, yeah, or COVID nineteen uh, research, yeah, within our university. So if we explore uh, who are the experts and also uh, what kind of research yeah, uh, conducted in the uh, COVID-19 research areas. So it can be uh, uh, showing uh, this uh, critical information, yeah, such as uh, the profile yeah, and then the research unit and also the research uh, output. Uh, the next features 
is also uh, I mentioned I had mentioned before yeah uh, regarding the uh, UN Sustainable Development Goals yeah on school and UNER yeah so uh, what is uh, important here uh, if we take a look at the 17 indicators of SDGs yeah Sustainable Development Goals yeah. Uh, you can go deeper on its uh, indicators of SDGs and you can find uh, the profiles of uh, the faculty members and also you can find the uh, uh, tip information yeah, regarding the research output uh, on its uh, indicators of uh, SDGs. And uh, the next uh, feature yeah, regarding the research data management uh, using Scholar UNED platform yeah, it can also show us uh, the map of the collaboration yeah, over the world. So for example here, if you want to see uh, our university collaboration yeah, uh, in United States of America, you can just click uh, the dot yeah, uh, in the uh, USA map yeah, and then you can find uh, which affiliation and then how many research uh, output. Yeah, that uh, already uh, conducted in collaboration way. So yeah, this is uh, really uh, important uh, for us yeah, to, in expanding the uh, collaboration and also to promote uh, the open science. Yeah. And then uh, the next uh, advanced features of a uh, scholar UNED platform is uh, fingerprint. So fingerprint is uh, related to our uh, expertise yeah, to our research interest yeah. and then here uh, you can sort by weight yeah, or you can sort by uh, alphabetically yeah, to know uh, what is uh, your uh, expertise. Yeah. And then uh, the next one we can also go to the uh, faculty uh, profile yeah. for example here if we want to take a look at the faculty of nursing uh, profile yeah, here we can find uh, the uh, expertise yeah, in this uh, faculty yeah, and also we can uh, look at the network yeah, and also we can uh, see the researcher uh, uh, profile yeah, within the faculty. So what I like most here, uh, if you uh, play with the research output, yeah, you can uh, find many important information yeah, uh, regarding the title yeah and also the type of the access yeah whether this is uh, open access or not and also uh, the because the scholar unit platform uh, also integrate with the plum x matrix yeah uh, actually we can uh, understand yeah uh, how many articles yeah already interact with the people outside especially in the online environments yeah so we can uh, understand the citation the usage yeah capture uh, mention and also uh, how many articles has been shared in uh, many social media. So yeah, this is uh, really uh, help us yeah to understand the impact of our research uh, output. And this one is the profile of our research unit. Uh, actually, almost similar with the uh, faculty profile. Yeah, but yeah, here you can also play with the fingerprint with the profile and also. Uh, you can uh, take a look uh, with the uh, collaboration map uh, on uh, its research unit. And again, here you can also uh, find the impact yeah, of the research output, yeah, especially in the online uh, environments. Yeah. And then, yeah, uh, this is uh, again, uh, let us uh, update yeah, and let us know that yeah, many people also uh, having interest in our research yeah so uh, the last one of my uh, session is uh, i want to show you uh, how to uh, actually uh, use the scholar UNER and also to update uh, the data regarding our uh, research data and this is very uh, simple ways yeah because uh, yeah everything has been uh, managed yeah by the pure yeah and uh, for the first time yeah actually if you are a new user uh, the admin uh, of the P1 at your institution will invite you through the uh, email, yeah, and then you have to uh, log in, uh, verify, yeah, and also complete all of the data. So when you are going into the uh, research dashboard, yeah, you can find uh, many uh, features, yeah, many menu, yeah, uh, that 
helping us in completing uh, research, yeah, teaching, and also community service uh, activities into one platform. So you, here you can entry the research output. Yeah, you can entry activities, uh, price, uh, application, award, project, data set, uh, student thesis, and also your curriculum fit. So in a simple way, this is uh, showing us our research life cycle yeah, from the planning until uh, the dissemination or publication. And then uh, for the research data uh, setup, yeah, if you want to make your data set uh, visible and also uh, uh, reusable by other people, yeah, you can also uh, set up uh, the data set yeah, by uh, entry the title, description, yeah, and also you can add the collaborators and who own the data set, yeah, and also you can set up the data availability. So yeah, everything very uh, easy and informative, yeah, on this dashboard, yeah, you can so you can easily uh, doing by yourself, yeah. So this is the references from my presentation, yeah, and this is a greeting, yeah, from our institute, yeah, uh, in a greeting of innovation writing and also publication, yeah. I think uh, that's all from me. Uh, thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, I, I pass on to Pak Juan. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Femi. Uh, and also, uh, thank you for sharing yeah, what is the practices from Universitas Erlangga in Indonesia on research data management. Because again, uh, there are a lot of questions you know, coming from institutions as well, coming from researchers as well. They might be uh, research coordinators or data uh, coordinators in their institutions and would like to know how it works uh, on institutions level. And I think your explanations, all the details already covered uh, tons of uh, questions yeah, coming from uh, our participants. So, um, yeah, we, I would like to also uh, call uh, Roxanne, yeah, uh, Roxanne and Ferry, because we are going to uh, go into the discussion yeah, or the Q&A yeah, for our um, session this um, morning and afternoon. So we actually already have, if I count everything, almost 100 questions. So we could end by tomorrow, maybe. <laughs> so it's going to be a lot, there are a lot of questions, but it's, uh, it's such a great uh, 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 webinar because you know with these questions it means that everybody is listening everybody wants to know more yeah and let's let's try to cover as many as we can with our time um, there are some questions that will be directed uh, specifically to Roxanne yeah some for uh, Ferry and maybe uh, some questions to uh, both of you okay so let me go into our Q and A that keeps uh, and I can see the number of questions keep on increasing. Okay, <laughs> but let's try it our best, yeah, to answer uh, these questions. Okay, so I think the first one, um, Roxanne, is you already are also uh, typing an answer, but I believe that this can be answered uh, live as well. So this is a question from Harry from Indonesia. So uh, for Harry, I know that managing data is very important in research, but not many institutions have the right technology to do this. Do you have any suggestions to manage the data in a simple way, way and can implement it with a minimum budget? Okay. Um, Roxanne, I think you're still on mute. Uh, no, we cannot hear you, Roxanne, sorry. Am I on now? Yeah, okay. Oh, good. Thank you so much. Um, so I was just going to respond about three simple suggestions to help people. Uh, one of the most important things is really the data management planning that people need to do in order to be able to start their project. And the both um, the ARDC project will be producing some simple templates and guidelines that everyone can use, but they're not out immediately. Uh, my other suggestion is that look at all of the templates that the University of California Data Curation Center makes freely available through their DMP tool. Anyone can use them in the world for free uh, and they have a really brilliant range of templates and there are different ones around health funders, um, environmental research, a whole lot of different guidelines and that will actually meet a lot of the 
uh, information need of people who've been raising the issue of biological materials as well, because the, the grant funders guidelines have framed the data management tools and the DMP tool, and I will post a, a link to that, um, mm. is just a really good way to start. Then in terms of storage and management of access, Work with your libraries. One of the things libraries tend to do is have uh, tools that have often been managed for publications using DSpace or other tools like that. And they can often be used to manage the research data as well. And they have management controls. So you, you can control who has access to them, make sure the metadata is right, share them with national systems, do all sorts of things like that. And I guess the third thing is keep talking about it because there may be other people in your um, in your country that are doing activities that can either be adapted or can be implemented in your individual institution. Mm, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Roxanne. I, I believe that, that the tips will be very uh, good yeah, for uh, everybody here. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Uh, I think we move now to uh, Ferry. So this is a question I believe coming from department level. So what would be your suggestion yeah, let's say if, if one faculty, one department, they start want to talk about data. Yeah, what would be your suggestions? How to start? How to start the conversation, basically? Yeah, uh, I think uh, in a simple way. Yeah, uh, we we have to deal with the uh, culture change. Yeah, like uh, Roxanne uh, mentioned on uh, her presentation. Yeah, and this is uh, a matter of uh, culture. Yeah, a matter of. Uh, uh, day over daily uh, academia life yeah so i think you can uh, start with uh, everyone around you yeah uh, whether your 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 friends yeah in in your uh, uh, department yeah and uh, try to uh, talk from the uh, smallest level of the uh, department yeah and you may uh, starting from the maybe your uh, uh, your uh, ppt file yeah from your uh, student assignment yeah from your uh, publication and yeah from uh, whatever uh, research uh, activities uh, that uh, you uh, have conducted at the uh, department level and i believe most uh, all of the uh, indonesian uh, lecturer uh, also comply with the three dharma yeah so teaching uh, researching and community service yeah and it, it should be um, uh, uh, done by all of the uh, lecturers of our indonesia so uh, I think uh, you can uh, try to talk with uh, all of all of uh, this issue yeah, with uh, your uh, partners and, and try to uh, advocate uh, with the higher level uh, uh, at your uh, department, yeah? maybe to your uh, faculty or even at your uh, university. So in my uh, uh, experience, uh, uh, the, our institute is uh, uh, assigned at the university level and we always uh, listening, yeah? We always uh, try to have a feedback from our uh, lecturers, and uh, one uh, of the issue was, uh, yeah, uh, about the research data management. And then uh, we, we we try to uh, have a conversation, yeah, with uh, those uh, who are uh, who were uh, raising this issue. And then, yeah, finally, uh, yeah, we can yeah come up with uh, some solution. So I think. Uh, you just uh, keep talking yeah and then also keep advocating yeah at the uh, uh, higher level of your institution mm, okay thank you thank you okay so uh, the next question is uh, for Roxanne there are lots and lots of questions about this Roxanne it's about collaboration yeah so I think because people are coming from so many countries they would like to know if the uh, the, the initiative yeah to manage data Australian research data Commons is open for international collaboration. Um, so the outputs from the work we're doing for from the Institutional Underpinnings Project is available to the world and we can collaborate on that, um, but we are funded for Australian solutions. However, this is a really interesting question that I will take back to the committee mm. that is um, delivering the Institutional Underpinnings work, because what we could do is consider creating a space where that we have more international examplers and international discussions. Um, and the research data uh, conference will be in Australia in two years time. Um, so if we did some preliminary work, maybe we could have a meeting and uh, uh, a session with many of the people who were here so that we can attend either virtually or face-to-face. -face. So thank you for raising that question. I will take it further. 
Wow. Okay. So it can this webinar can uh, change the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe uh, this is a questions that are related to to what you just explained. So I, I take this question to you again, uh, Roxanne. So uh, we know that uh, with when we talk about data, data management, yeah, uh, there will be some issues when we have like a trans uh, border data management yep. policies. There will be differences between one country to another. So do you think that there is a, a solution or can we somehow have like an integrated data management on a global level or will it be based just on national level and maybe some uh, integrations here and there but it's yeah your take can we take it in a, in a global level or yep. it will stay in a regional or even just a country level so because of the environment we're in, lots of um, funders that our researchers wish to apply for funding from are outside country. Mm. Places like Mellon Foundation, places like Gates Foundation, uh, all collaborative applications for funding from National Institutes for Health in the US or from the National Health and Research Medical Centre in Australia. So it seems to me that we can do some um, countrywide modelling, but that countrywide modelling has to work in a global environment because of the nature of funding um, mm. and collaboration in research. Oh, okay, okay. So somehow it will uh, have to come together. Yeah, it will come together. There will be some international uh, policies that we also have to uh, follow, standard practices, and so on, right? Okay, thank you. Thank you, yep. Roxanne. So, to Ferry, okay. Uh, when we talk about data, um, of course, yeah, do you have like any in your university? Do you have any faculty capacity training? Yeah, so lecturers, faculty members yeah, can trans can can trans uh, translate this idea of data management to even students. You know, uh, do you have this kind of uh, policies happening in your university right now? Yeah, I think uh, this is a very important uh, question and. To us, uh, actually, the research data management, yeah, it's uh, also a new things, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then we learn so much uh, from uh, the Elsevier teams, yeah, <laughs> how to uh, manage uh, the data actually. And then uh, we we try to we try we have tried uh, our best, yeah, uh, to uh, provide uh, uh, some some training, yeah, especially uh, for the uh, faculty member at a uh, faculty level. So. Uh, because I I am assigned at the university level, uh, we do have uh, responsibility yeah, to train uh, all of the faculty members yeah regarding on uh, uh, using the the research data management yeah by uh, uh, completing and also uh, try to keep in touch yeah with the uh, updating on a scholar uh, platform yeah so we we, we just uh, did uh, this the training yeah uh, since uh, the last the last year yeah when our platform uh, launched yeah and then uh, we we also uh, happy to receive yeah many uh, feedback yeah especially from the uh, S L team yeah and uh, we are planning to integrate uh, more all of the data yeah especially from the internal data because uh, mostly uh, for the external data we don't have any uh, any troubles yeah we don't have any uh, obstacles yeah uh, we can easily uh, pull out all of the data from the scopus yeah web of science yeah and many others uh, uh, giant databases yeah but still we are struggling with the uh, internal data so our next planning is uh, we want to integrate and also make uh, all of the internal data uh, more uh, comply with the FED principle. Yeah, that's uh, what we do. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So this is to both speakers, but I believe uh, Ferry can answer this one first. Okay. You are managing and organizing a lot of data. So how do you assure the protection of this data from data theft, hacking and other side, uh, cyber crimes around because this is this is might, might be something that researchers also worry yeah they they are okay to sharing their data but how can they be sure that their institution uh, would protect the data yeah i think uh, uh, what can i answer is uh, for the security and privacy it is uh, really uh, our uh, big priority yeah that's why 
uh, we are very happy to collaborate with the uh, Soviet, yeah, <laughs> because <laughs> most of the security and privacy issues uh, also uh, held by the uh, third party. Uh, but uh, in internal, yeah, uh, I, I we do believe that we also have uh, some uh, compliance and uh, guideline, yeah, how to uh, protect uh, our uh, research data. So in in specific ways, yeah, I think I should uh, look at. Uh, the guideline from our uh, directorate system information yeah but yeah i, I would be uh, uh, very happy to let you know yeah in in detail regarding the uh, security and uh, privacy issues yeah. mm -hmm. okay so, so basically we, we don't have to worry <laughs> uh, about this because of course uh from institution side there are lots and lots of uh policies yeah and also practices to protect uh data sharing and management okay thank you so much uh from roxanne how, how should you know should they be worried about this issue cyber security is a really big issue mm. um and uh universities have different ways to protect information and, and cyber security isn't just about making sure it's secure internally but a making sure you have the right controls because various people will need to have access to information. We actually conduct cybersecurity assessments and pri do privacy impact assessments for many of the tools and services. Um, and I've done more than 150 of the privacy impact assessments for various surveys and other uh, and products at ANU. And you can actually see on our website a whole lot of the guidance around that. But it takes resources to do the cybersecurity assessment and the privacy impact uh, assessments and ensure that you have systems that will be compliant. Mm. And um, it's an area where those people who are hackers uh, continue to innovate uh, and require significant resourcing within all of our institutions. Okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. No, thank you. Thank you, Roxanne, for sharing. What, 150, Roxanne? Ah, wow. uh, privacy <laughs> impact assessments. Yeah, huge. <laughs> it's a big business. <laughs> Okay, Keeps so me busy. Uh, maybe, yeah. uh, to, to both of you, this is a question more about the role or the position. When we talk about research data management in a university, who should this falls, uh, this, this whole policy falls into? Is it librarian, specific sections of library? Is it through uh, for research office? Who should be in charge of research data management? Maybe start with you, Roxanne. What do you think? Oh, look, I think this is just a fascinating question. And in Australia, you'd think 39 universities, we'd have a simple model that we'd apply, but every university is different. So in some places, it sits in the library, scholarly information services in my area. In some places, it's an office that sits within the uh, information technology area. In one university, it sits with records management. In another area, another university, they've created a whole new unit that sits independently from everyone. Um, so I guess every university or every research institution makes its own decision, and there are at least a dozen different models happening in Australia. Mm, okay, so yeah, I, I would say that well, it really also depends on the university, the policies, how, how it is, the practices, right? Okay, yep. so from uh. Ferry, what, what do you think? Who, who should be in charge of RDM? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's uh, depend on the policy at its uh, university, yeah, because uh, mostly at university, they already uh, set up some unit, yeah, some uh, institute, yeah, uh, also a library yeah, uh, to manage uh, all of the uh, duties yeah, related to the three uh, dharma of uh, our faculty members. Yeah. So, uh, for example, in my uh, institution, yeah, uh, the library also having a repository, yeah, especially for the for keeping and also uh, uh, storage uh, the research result, yeah, from the uh, research output, yeah. But uh, the repository uh, uh, don't have any uh, integration function with uh, all of the uh, data, yeah, uh, across the faculties, yeah. So, uh, for the integration and also. Uh, for the research data uh, management, yeah, it's uh, belong to the uh, Institute for Innovation, Journal Development, Publishing, and Intellectual uh, Property Rights, yeah, uh, because uh, we uh, already uh, assign uh, some uh, responsibilities, yeah, uh, in the uh, especially in the uh, research output integration and how to make the data more uh, centralized, yeah, and uh, more integrated, yeah, for uh, informing us to make. Uh, uh, allied uh, decision making, yeah, especially uh, regarding 
to the performance uh, of the uh, university. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for sharing that. Uh, uh, very. Okay. So the next questions. I believe we only have time for two more questions. Yeah. Uh, they're actually still like eighty six. So. <laughs> It will be two, three, two, two days if we can answer all of uh, these questions, but two more questions. Okay, so uh, the first, uh, the, the, this one, it's about, uh, okay, how long will you st uh, basically store the data? So from, let's say from uh, Australia's perspective, do you have any policies on uh, the data itself? How, for how many months, how many years yeah, that the data will be preserved or will it be deleted or will it be just, uh, it will just stay there forever. Uh, what do you think about this this record data management in terms of the time the, the time period in which it will be stored, uh, Roxanne? Yep. So there are probably a whole lot of layers. This is a fascinating area. Um, some of the data that we collect, there is actually we have an Archives Act in Australia, and a lot of that data we actually um, need to apply the records. This is the records thinking. Uh, what is the retention period that we have agreed in our retention um, standards uh, with um, the National Archives of Australia that we must comply with? For others, there are particularly participant agreements for social sciences, for qualitative studies, where mm. we promise the participant that we will only keep the data for a certain period of time, which might be seven years which we need to comply with. And for quite a lot of other data, there are international standards that we uh, like to comply with. For example, biological materials may have requirements around standards. And then there are additional complexities. So sometimes we have indigenous biological materials and um, we may need to repatriate those to the community in different ways. Mm. So this is one of the most fascinating areas. Um, and there are, international like ICIP uh, agreements around Indigenous data as well. So we try to make all of these intelligible, but researchers really have to do quite a lot of research in order to determine the period that they need to do data retention for. Mm, okay, so of course there will be a lot of discussions. It really depends on what kind of data, uh, of course the policies, and maybe even uh, related to some cultures as well. So there yep. are a lot of uh, variables to then determine what will be the, the period to store uh, the data then yeah thank you thank you Roxanne how about you uh from very uh, point of view about the how long the data will be kept or it will be forever or will you delete in some, uh, in some years yeah what will be the, the policy here? yeah uh, actually for the data storage and uh, retention yeah it, it has been uh, mentioned at the uh, low number 11 uh, year 2019 yeah regarding the national system of science and uh, technology and uh, some of the technical uh, guideline yeah also mentioned that for the retention it would be uh, ranges yeah from 3 to uh, 5 years yeah depend on the type of the data yeah but uh, once again uh, uh, maybe the policy it's uh, changes yeah because uh, right now we we do have a new agency yeah, on the research and national innovation yeah and yeah I'm, I'm not sure what is the latest policy regarding the retention of the data but normally yeah we can keep the data from uh, three to uh, five years mm, okay so there's a policy there's a national policy uh and based on this national policy then of course from uh let's say from from your context from indonesian universities will have to follow uh the national policy then yeah Okay, thank you, thank you for that. Okay, last questions, uh, one for Roxanne, one for uh, Ferry, yeah. Uh, okay, so for Roxanne, yeah, I believe the, the questions is, uh, again, yeah, this is uh, dealing with a lot of ethical uh, issues yeah, uh, surrounding data, uh, especially, uh, actually this one coming from students. I believe that <laughs> yeah, it is a nice uh, point of view from students because uh, this is a student that currently a graduate researcher, yeah, and, uh, I believe she is basically uh, try to navigate. Yeah, this is a little bit outside of her responsibilities, outside of capacities. But of course, students want to know. Um, it's it's a, it's a simple question. You know, when a students create a research, you know, and they have all of this data, uh, can be interview, can be survey questions, anything. So should they uh, should they use their own personal folder, or should they talk with their university and see if uh, any of the data coming from students should be stored somewhere. 
what what do you think would be the best approach? Because when we talk about students, we are talking about uh, thousands, <laughs> thousands of students and billions, maybe billions of data. So what would be the best approach uh, for students and data management? So I think the best approach for students in data management is to talk to your local library or research service or uh, area that supports research uh, data management. And this is, I say this for two reasons. One is that it's the most important time in your career to build research data management knowledge and skills. Mm. So having the conversation will help people talk to you to understand were there conditions around the research data, was the metadata appropriate, um, was the ethics uh, successful and human ethics uh, teams are absolutely wonderful agents to help you in this. And so it's probably the conversation is more important to build knowledge rather than just to find a place to store material. But the other thing is that if you do want to use that, reference that material in future publications, you will most likely be needing to have a, a data storage that is an institutional one in order to submit mm -hmm. your paper. So come and talk to your partners in the university and we're there to help you figure out future use, current use requirements. Um, and it's a conversation we love to have. Yeah, of course. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Roxanne. Okay, so last questions to Ferry. This is about, uh, again, there are a lot of questions about collaboration. So basically uh, you know, for, for research data management in uh, Erlanga University, are you open for any international collaborations? And do you have any requirements or any process that needs to be done if anyone from any universities wants to have collaborations with you? Yeah, thank you, Bajuan. Yeah, I think we are very open uh, to anyone yeah, for the uh, collaboration matters. Yeah, and uh, we are very happy to let you know that uh, within university, we do have uh, AGE, yeah, Langa Global Engagement. Yeah. And uh, this uh, directorate uh, in charge uh, of the collaboration matters. So, if you are interested with uh, one of those uh, uh, program that I have mentioned on my presentation, yeah, you can try to contact them. Yeah, just uh, type in in Google's and uh, uh, Global Engagement. Yeah, and then you can find uh, many information there. Yeah. And we, we look forward to uh, your uh, collaboration. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, so we come to the end of our session. Thank you so much, Roxanne. Thank you so much, Ferry, for sharing wonderful insights. I learned so much. I personally learned so much. And I believe uh, our attendees also learned lots and lots of things from both of you. Uh, from nation-wide level, how data is being managed, all the wonderful projects that you are working on right now, Roxanne. Thank you so much for sharing that. And of course, there will be more uh, amazing uh, stories coming from you uh, as the project uh, keeps on continuing. We'll see, we'll hear a lot from Australia. So thank you so much for sharing that. So very as well, from institutional point of view, there's so many things that we learned that uh, from institution, we need to start establishing um, conversation, discussion with the data. Uh, do it from faculty level, even to students as well. And from that, build up that uh, build up the data management, you know, have a policy, have a strategy, implement it into you know, using software, anything uh, in terms of, uh, to, to make sure that the data management is really uh, within your institution. And of course, yeah, it, it can open a lot of collaborations later in the future. So again, thank you so much, Roxanne. Thank you so much, Ferry, for uh, sharing uh, your insights. Yeah? And to all of our attendees, thank you for uh, joining. But before I close this session, I would like to just quickly share important information. Okay, so let me share my screen. Okay, so my um, information is on the post-event survey and also certificate. Uh, just a quick announcement for everyone again that um, for the post-event survey and also certificate, this is what will happen. So by tomorrow, you would receive an email from Zoom and you can find information on the recordings of this session, the slide, and also the e-certificate. Yeah, so please pay uh, attention to your email. Yeah, there will be uh, one coming from Zoom. Okay, and for the e-certificate, you can download uh, a week after you receive the email. Yeah, um, so you don't have to do it exactly by tomorrow. You can wait uh, even until for a week. Yeah, for you to download all of the informations on the e-certificate, including the link and also the workshop code will be available there. Yeah, so again, yeah, uh, by tomorrow, 
uh, please check your email. Yeah, it's it's going to come from Zoom, and you can find all of the related informations over there. Okay. Now, oh, have, sorry, we just yeah. still have a poll to actually run. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, that's for the post event survey and certificate informations. Yeah. Now uh, to close this um, event, yeah, I would like to uh, quickly run a uh, end poll. Yeah, because I believe everyone already learned. So hopefully that will show up in our poll as well. So let's start with our end poll. Yeah. A quick one for everyone joining us. How confident are you now <laughs> in your understanding of research data management? after hearing from both speakers yeah let's see we have uh 20 now yeah 25 now okay wow it's so fast okay let's wait a bit yeah so how confident are you in your understanding of research data management after hearing from both speakers are you very confident yeah are you somewhat confident i'm uh not confident or not confident at all yeah <laughs> So are you very confident, somewhat confident, not, but will reach for further support, or I am not confident. Okay, let's wait for, I think, 20 seconds before we end. Okay, we already have 65% of you answering. Okay. Closing to 68 now. Okay, we are going to close this in 10 seconds. So if you haven't answered, yeah, how confident are you in your understanding of RDM after hearing from both speakers? Okay, yeah. Yep, I believe we can close the poll and let's share the result to everyone. Okay, so as you can see yeah, on your screen, 35% uh, hmm. of you are very confident. That's uh, amazing, yeah. 56% uh, of you somewhat confident, yeah. 9% still con uh, still not confident, but will reach for further support. And only six of you answer that I am still not confident. So this this shows it's a, such a great uh, webinar. Yeah. Uh, thank you for again for both speakers because we are seeing movement from not confident at all. Yeah. Now to uh, yeah, still a um, little bit not confident, but it's okay. I will reach for further support. That's great. Yeah, please talk with your institutions on research data management policies. Some of you already say I'm somewhat confident. I understand what RDM is, and of course, yeah, you will learn more and more about RDM. And 35% of you say very confident. So that's amazing. Yeah. So we we want to hear more from each of you on your institution. Uh, on your research data management in your institutions because you are very confident. So it should uh, we should see more institutions talking and discussing and providing a lot of policies and strategies to implement uh, research data management. Yeah. So thank you uh, for that. Yeah. So to close this event, yeah, I would like to just quickly announce that of course this is not the last for us. We will have more webinars coming coming and the next one yeah, our next event will be a reviewer workshop how to get the most out of being a reviewer of scientific articles yeah so i believe a lot of researchers here you want to be a reviewer so let's hear from hendrik rudolph yeah uh, and also biswana duta so hendrik is the editor in chief of applied surface science from elsevier and bis uh, one at two times publishers at Elsevier Journals. It will be uh, August 10 at yeah, 2.30 uh, cell time. Yeah, so please make sure you um, you, you know yeah, the, the time zone uh, that works in your uh, country. And to register, again, you will, uh, you will uh, be sent an email from Zoom. And from that, you will see uh, the link for registrations uh, for this next event. Okay, so again, uh, last time, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, from Elsevier Asia Pacific, I uh, would like to uh, give our uh, sincere gratitude to Roxanne. Thank you so much yeah, for taking your time of lunch and <laughs> share your insights with all of us. Thank you so much, Perry, also for sharing this. And of course, to all participants, um, yeah, we believe that we we work together, yeah, in uh, as a researchers community to expand the boundaries of knowledge for the benefit of humanity. Yeah, for that, we thank you, everyone, and see you on our next event. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Roxanne. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.